Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, it's Friday. We've made it through a full week of shows. Thanks for the support. Hope you enjoy everyone getting a kick out of these episodes on the Ukraine crisis. Today's episode is about leadership in wartime and leadership when states and nations are under attack from an outside force. A lot of conversations around Ukraine have centered around Zelensky's leadership, Biden's leadership, Biden's leadership, and how countries should respond to these types of situations. So I brought on Professor Ian Buruma. Ian has written a book. It's called The Churchill Complex, and it's basically about how Winston Churchill and his model of leadership and how his response to the post-Munich period really shaped the way we in the West, but especially the U.S. and Great Britain, think about conflicts. So we talk about Churchill, we talk about Munich, we also speak about Zelensky and broader topics that Ian's worked on, including Japan, Germany, births of new worlds, which we're undergoing right now. Lots of great stuff. Hope you enjoy the episode. Ian Baruma, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you. We've been doing daily coverage of Ukraine through long form, taking a wider step out context. And I've just been looking through this, the list of books you've written recently. We're going to be able to hit this in a couple of different ways, everything from Germany and Japan post-World War II to Year Zero, which is your book about the war after 1945, to your most recent book, The Churchill Complex. I was, I was reading the Churchill Complex, and this line really stuck out with me that I'd love for you to explain, which is the, the, the West essentially has been haunted by memories of, of Munich and, and, and memories of, of Churchill, um, specifically um, the, the, the appeasement at Munich and then also Winston Churchill's leadership. So can you explain what you meant by that in terms of how it has shaped our responses to crises ever since the 30s and 40s? Yes, I think when you say the West, we have to distinguish um, between um, Britain and the United States uh, on the one, one hand and countries in Europe that had been occupied by Nazi Germany and so on on the other. They, they're also haunted by World War II and memories of the war and so on, but in a different way. Um, what I meant by the Churchill complex is um, uh, that the, the victors of World War II um, in the West, Britain and America specifically, of course, in Eastern Europe, it would be the Soviet Union, um, have been haunted by the fact that especially US presidents have been terrified of going down history in the way that uh, Chamberlain has done um, as an appeaser, as somebody who didn't stand up to a dictator uh, and so on. And uh, they love to go down in history as a Churchill figure. And this is, is a myth really that was created partly, uh, it's, it, it's not just a myth, it's based on some sort of reality that in 1940, Churchill uh, came to the fore as a, as a great voice for the morale of Britain. But it's also a myth that was largely created by Churchill himself after the war as himself as the great hero who always knew that Britain had to stand up to Germany and so on, whereas Chamberlain was the coward who didn't. Now, this is not historically entirely accurate, but it's a very strong myth. And it's led uh, the United States being a much more powerful uh, country after the war than Britain uh, into embarking on some foolish wars because American leaders wanted to be Churchill and not Chamberlain. Especially in the lead up and immediate aftermath to Russia's invasion, the words appeasement Munich were thrown around. So can you just explain for the audience within the context of this separating the myth from reality, what would be the story of Munich appeasement and then eventually Churchill's leadership from your perspective? Well, the, the, the big difference, yes, you're quite right. People do bandy this about and, and, and have done at every foreign crisis uh, since the war. I mean, as soon as there's a crisis, whether it was... Uh, uh, what was then known as Red China, uh, shooting off missiles to a little island near Taiwan, or whether it was um, the Soviet Union uh, and so on. Every time this, this great ghost of Munich 38 comes up. What really happened in 1938 is that uh, Hitler was clearly belligerent, um, was bent on uh, expanding German power in Europe, and Britain, neither Britain nor France were really, um, uh, especially Britain, 
um, were ready to start a war with Germany um, in, in any kind of military terms. I mean, they were not they were not prepared enough. So uh, Roosevelt, um, sorry, not Roosevelt, uh, Chamberlain was was really playing for time when he met uh, Hitler in Munich. Um, and Hitler wanted part of Czechoslovakia, which was the Sudetenland, which uh, had a large German speaking population. And there is a, uh, a parallel with our own time in one respect, which is that Hitler sought to expand the borders of Germany to incorporate areas of Europe with large German speaking populations uh, in Czechoslovakia uh, and in Poland uh, in particular just as um, Vladimir Putin um, has this vision of a greater Russia incorporating parts of other countries that have a lot of Russian speakers. But the great difference between then and now is that the United States is not at all weak in any kind of military sense. And NATO is not weaker than, uh, than Russia today, um, as far as um, armaments and so on uh, is concerned. So they're in a very, President Biden is in a very different position from uh, Chamberlain at the time. Now, it may be that uh, in retrospect, that had Chamberlain called Hitler's bluff and together with France decided that it was worth going to war over uh, the Sudetenland, that chunk of Czechoslovakia, perhaps things would have been worked out better. Perhaps Hitler would have been stopped in his tracks. But it's by no means certain. And so to paint Chamberlain as a coward and Churchill as a hero, uh, again, is very much the Churchillian myth. And sometimes it's better when uh, leaders of democracies uh, do not want to be great heroes, but simply want to keep things under control and stop wars from um, uh, from happening. And in that sense, I would not fault um, Joe Biden. I think he's played it cool and um, and and has been very wise to do so. You've alluded to this, but can you talk about the examples post-World War II on of critics bringing up the Munich example? So one could think of, like you said, the incident with China, you could think of during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, this is also complicated for JFK because his father was a very very direct appeaser. And I think the word coward would apply much more closer to him than it would to um, Chamberlain. So, but can you just speak about this history of the weaponization of this term and how it has and has not caused actual disaster in it, in, in, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual construct, I'd say? Well, I think the biggest, it's hard to say that the Korean War was a disaster because after all, uh, North Korea did inv invade South Korea, but it was certainly used then. Um, it was used uh, during the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, as you say. But again, I think in the end, uh, President Kennedy kept his head cool. But he he wrote a book about called I think When England Slept, which was very much about those uh, years just before the war, um, when his father was an appeaser. Um, I'm not sure he was an appeaser out of cowardice. I think he was more an appeaser out of uh, conviction. I mean, he was sympathetic to Nazi Germany and not sympathetic to Britain at all, not a natural Democrat, uh, was closer to the um, America firsters at the time um, who, like Donald Trump, um, wanted to keep America out of any kind of international conflict. I suppose one of the, the most, well, the two most disastrous examples are the Vietnam War, when uh, President Johnson alluded to uh, Munich 1938 on various occasions, uh, compared the South Vietnamese uh, ruler at, at the time, I think it was Diem, uh, to Winston Churchill, saw himself in the heroic mode, um, and uh, we know what happened there. Uh, and then again, in the run up to the Iraq war, um, both Tony Blair and um, George W. Bush saw themselves in a Church Churchillian mode. Um, and Tony Blair writes in his memoirs in the, uh, the immediate um, period before uh, the invasion of, of Iraq, uh, that he's at his country house in Chequers, or the prime minister's country house, reading Chamberlain's diaries and saying to himself, this is not the way I want to go. And so he was directly influenced by what happened in 1938 
um, and it, con it, it confirmed his conviction that he should stay stand with the Americans uh, in Iraq, whatever the Americans decided to do. And of course, it was the, an American decision uh, in which Blair had very on the, which Blair had very little influence. It's interesting as a historian, you're describing how history has been misused by folks in good and bad faith. There's a case to be seen in both those issue areas. How do you suggest that leaders and people thinking through these issues use history as a method for thinking about the present then? Well, as a method of thinking about the present, the history is indispensable because we don't really understand where we are if we don't know anything about history. But uh, I think the, the, the mistake that's made over and over is to assume that history repeats itself. Um, and uh, that's almost never true. I mean, yes, certain things recur, but always in a different and unexpected way. So uh, a good example of this is um, one of the, well, one can call it war crimes on the Western side in World War II was bombing um, civilian areas in large cities to smithereens and um, uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people both in Germany and in Japan, even when there was no military re reason to do so. And one of the reasons that uh, first the British and then the Americans as well chose to do this, to terrorize civilian populations, which is a war crime, uh, thinking that morale would, would break and people would turn against their leaders, which is almost never the case, was really the experience of World War I. Um, when, after all, a lot of the people who uh, were in senior positions in World War II had fought in World War I, and they remember the trenches, they remember the war of attrition when huge numbers of soldiers died in horrible circumstances, facing one another in large armies entrenched, um, bombarding each other and so on. And in order to avoid uh, a conflict like that, they assumed the same thing might happen in World War II. They thought bombing from civilians from a great height would be the way to go. So that's an example where people draw the wrong conclusion uh, from history. And I think, well, the lesson to draw from that is one should judge every situation on its own merits and not simply um, model oneself on what people did in different circumstances in the past. Another question we've dealt then with the first myth, which is the myth of Munich. I'd like to talk about the myth in your wording of Churchill's leadership and his specific model for how a 20th century, going into 21st century leader should behave. So I'd love you just to talk about Churchill and how we should conceive of him. Sure. Not just in the World War II height of all of the greatest parts of him, but also in the broader sense. Well, Churchill is the kind of politician that in normal circumstances, you don't particularly want to have. I mean, he was a romantic, he was a showman, he was in some ways uh, disreputable. Uh, he, he was not ideal as a peacetime prime minister, but he was a little bit like Vladimir Zelensky in the Ukraine today, who was also, of course, he's a professional showman. Churchill was a professional politician and a showman. But there are moments that you need a showman and somebody who can really give speeches and, and um, raise the morale of a people when they're at a very low ebb and with their backs to the wall and so on, to mix metaphors. And Churchill, just as Zelensky is the right guy for the, this moment in the Ukraine, uh, Churchill was the right guy in May 1940. It was exactly his theatrical uh, talent his bloody mindedness, his romanticism and so on, his way with words that was needed to um, keep the morale alive uh, in a nation that uh, was under huge threat. Um, later um, in the war, Churchill was perhaps less ideal. He's not a very good strategist. His own generals and admirals uh, had a lot of trouble with him. And certainly after the war, he wasn't the worst prime minister, but he was uh, not only an old man, but he was not really equipped uh, to lead a war in, in, in peace. But there, so there are these figures who like Churchill, and Churchill is the model of that, who had, in a very specific moment are exactly right. But 
should not be seen ever as a model to follow in, in less dire circumstances. Yeah, it's interesting to your point, people spent a lot of time pointing out the fact that Zelensky's poll numbers were around 25% before this crisis happened. So that was an example of how his specific skill set probably wasn't ideally suited to handling corruption or handling the messy nature of Ukraine pre-invasion, but in this specific moment. So let's talk then about leaders attempting to ape Churchill then. So this is the Lyndon Johnson reference you made. This is the Bush reference you made. This is the this is the Blair reference. Um, I'm not sure how on Twitter you are, but there's been this interesting discourse, especially in the United States and certain parts of Europe by saying, Zelensky is so unique. He's unlike our leaders. He's he's brave. I doubt that our leaders would stay and fight. Just, just how do you think of this broader post, once again, post-World War II in the US, post-Kennedy, real lack of faith in our leaders and the idealization of certain types over others, just the broad construct. Well, the United States in, in many ways is, is the antithesis of uh, Britain in 1938. Even though Britain in 1938 had a large empire and was, was a very serious global power, but it was not um, uh, it was not dominant in any kind of military sense. The United States, since World War II, um, has been a dominant military power. Yes, there was the Soviet Union with its nuclear weapons and so on, but the United States really was um, almighty in, in a military sense. Now, that kind of military dominance did not necessarily um, help you in a, in a guerrilla war uh, or against um, opponents like the North Vietnamese, um, which is a sort of asymmetrical conflict in many ways. Nonetheless, um, the United States has the power to destroy the world many times over. And what you need then is leaders who know how to deal with that kind of power very responsibly. America is not a country with its back to the wall that has to sort of fight for its survival against any enemies, even though sometimes the political rhetoric of some politicians seems to, to suggest that, you know, as happened in the early 50s when communism was suddenly seen as an ex existential threat, which of course it never was. So you need responsible leaders who can keep their heads cool. And uh, what you need now, especially, and, and this is a serious crisis, uh, is a leader who can keep his head cool and not, a, not somebody who wants to be a hero. And so uh, I think it's a good thing that we have uh, so far uh, Joe Biden, who's um, a bit like Chamberlain. Um, he's a good professional Paul. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's not a hero. He's not a, a warmonger. He's not a romantic like Churchill. He's a professional politician. Um, and I think that's what you need right now. You need somebody who can stop this war from getting out of control. And so when people say we need heroes like Zelensky, it's to mis misjudge the situation. Yes, in the Ukraine, you need a Zelensky, not in the United States at, at this moment. Because if there were a leader in the White House right now who would see this as an existential threat and start um, you know, answering Putin's um, nuclear threats with even greater nuclear threats, well, then we have a chance of the, the whole world blowing itself up. No, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Taking a step back, what so away from just the Ukraine crisis, what style of leadership do you think the United States needs broadly during this period of economic, political disruption, lack of unity, what, 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 do you, what do you interpret are the skill sets necessary? Well, it's very difficult to say. I mean, you can talk about skill sets, but uh, one of the th threats uh, to, uh, well, the democratic system in the United States is that uh, one of the two main, main parties is not playing by the old rules. And uh, I mean, the, a, 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 a democratic system can rests on laws, of course, but it also rests, rests on agreements, on agreed ways to behave, uh, on support of uh, the constitution and so on and so forth. Um, if one party, and that has happened under Trump, decides they're going to um, basically uh, trample all over those rules, and do whatever it takes to win an election and then perhaps keep power by um, twisting the rules even further, you have a real problem. It's, it's an institutional problem. 
Now, how uh, the Democrats and the Democratic leader should respond to that is that's a very tough question. Um, both um, uh, Barack Obama and uh, Joe Biden have started off um, promising that they would sort of restore order by being bipartisan, by um, uh, cooperating with the other party and so on and so forth. Well, we know that that hasn't really worked very well. Um, would it be better then to um, mimic the other party and, and sort of fight dirty and twist the rules in the same way? Well, no, that would probably destroy the system even further. So um, I don't have a, a glib and unequivocal answer to your question. I mean, I think what you need is somebody who really understands how democracy works. And again, without seeming wanting to be a sort of booster for Joe Biden, I think in some ways he's an underrated politician because I think it's good to have a professional like him who does understand how the system works. He's never, he's not a genius. He's not a hero. He probably won't go down in the history books as a great, one of the great men. But I don't think democracies are well served on the whole by great men. Democracies are served by sometimes more mediocre people, but who, under, who understand the system, who know the art of compromise, uh, who know, who can wheel and deal, but still have principles. Um, but as I said, that becomes very difficult when the other side doesn't play the game. Another question that comes up is just the, the purpose of speechifying in the political historical environment you're describing, because I think partially because many of my generation were raised on the West Wing, we, we, and then movies like Darkest Hour from 2017 with, from uh, um, you know, Gary Oldman as Churchill, we have this image of a successful politician as being able to deliver a speech that seizes a moment and, and galvanizes. And, and given, and I'm thinking out loud here, but given what you're saying, I'm not quite sure what a big Joe Biden speech would accomplish. So just, and this once again falls into the Churchillian complex, the Churchillian framework. Just can you talk about speeches and what they do and don't mean? Well, speeches can be very important. And uh, one of the great re speech makers was Barack Obama. I mean, whatever his flaws may be, he was certainly a great, uh, he had a real command of language. He's one of the few presidents, certainly in modern times, who could actually write a, a very literate book. Um, or even a literary book. Um, most presidents probably wouldn't even be able to write a literate one, um, let alone a literary one. So uh, Obama had, had a, a real feeling for the English language and used it very well. Um, something, this is something that Joe Biden will never really learn. He's never been a great speech maker or rhet rhetorician. Uh, it would be foolish to expect him to do so. It can, I think great speeches can, um, they can bring a country together uh, at a time when it is necessary, um, at times of crisis. Uh, and Roosevelt was famously good at this in his fireside chats. Um, I'm not sure that this is a moment in the United States uh, that great speeches are the thing that, that we should, want most. I mean, it would be useful if Joe Biden were better at it, but I don't think it's a huge loss that he isn't. Um, this is not a moment of existential crisis in the United States, unlike, again, uh, uh, the Ukraine, and we should really keep that distinction in mind. Yes, it's, it's very helpful. So now what I want to do is I want to get into a couple of your other books that hit upon... Sorry, to, can, can I just add something to this? Oh, to please, last please question? do. Yeah, please I do. Mean, uh, uh, Donald Trump is, of course, a very weird figure in this respect, because he doesn't have any command of the English language. He's neither literary nor literate, but he was very effective. And um, he's the first, of course, tweet uh, rhetorician uh, in history, in, in the history of the United States anyway who used Twitter uh, to, to very good effect. And he knew how to rhetorically press certain buttons in his audience. And he did that very skillfully without having any um, command uh, of the English language. Um, that 
we would recognize as, as, uh, as literate. And so uh, we should not underestimate his skill, um, which is a very peculiar one um, and, it, and may be required again in, in, in the future. Now, I'm, I'm glad you went there because it brings to mind a social media question I've been thinking about. So Zelensky is very good at um, video. He's an actor. That's his background. And what he's also good at doing is using video to help actually and social media to actually accomplish his political objectives. Um, many people talk about AOC. She's incredibly talented. She's incredibly good at video, but she isn't actually able to translate her social media expertise into actually accomplishing her political and policy objectives. The Green New Deal, you can get 1 million views on YouTube. It doesn't matter because the Green New Deal won't pass regardless. And then to your point, Trump, once again, build the wall is, that's, a, that's you know, your professor, that's D minus rhetoric at best, and it's being rather generous, but it actually accomplishes political objective of winning the presidency, of changing the Republican Party's position on immigration. So how do you just think about social media as an added space where rhetoric does and doesn't matter in different ways? Well, it's a very good question. I think, uh, again, Donald Trump did understand something very clearly, instinctively almost, about how the social media can be used and how you can um, basically jump over the traditional media, the newspapers, the uh, you know the television, and so on, and and speak directly to your uh, supporters, your constituency. Um, in a way that that politi democratic politicians were never able to do before. Um, and it's obviously important to have those skills. Uh, it's something that probably Joe Biden will never have. He's, he's too old and, and he doesn't have it. Um, AOC does. Uh, so yes, I think um, uh, knowing a way around the social media and how to use them uh, is going to be a, a vital skill for uh, leaders in the future. But it's very difficult, I think, at this point to know exactly how uh, that will pan out because we don't know what's uh, what will happen with the social media. Um, it, at the moment, it's a free for all, at least in in, a, in an open society, it is with no filters. Uh, it may not always be like that. I, I sort of hope it won't. And I hope that there will be some way that um, things can be edited in the way that a good newspaper can be edited. Um, but uh, exactly, don't ask me exactly how that uh, should be accomplished because I don't have an answer. But yes, a politician should have AOC skills uh, and at the same time know how to, um, to wheel and deal and compromise and, 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 uh, and, and accomplish something. So words are not enough, but they are very important. Yeah. So to a couple of your other books, I'd like to hit on. So you, you wrote this book in 2013 that I, I've started to read. It's called Year Zero. It's about uh, the world immediately after 1945. It actually ties deeply into um, your personal biography um, as, as a European. I'd just like to, there's a lot of rhetoric right now about how, and I, and I think this is largely true, which is that the invasion of Ukraine represents the death of a certain, of two different worlds. So world one could be once again, that post 1945 world that was constructed in the E recount, but also this post cold war world. This is separate from just the end of history debate, just like this very, a set of assumptions just don't seem to be valid anymore. Can you just talk about that immediate period from 1945, basically to 1949, where you do have individuals, institutions, countries able to shape things? What can you shape? What can't you shape? How should we conceive of these moments in time? Well, at the end of a war, like the end of a dictatorship, is always a very dangerous time. I mean, we assume that, you know, one side wins, the other side loses, and the world goes on, and, you know, the winners get to write, rewrite history, or, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, the West won, not only the West, the, so the West plus the Soviet Union, um, uh, won the war against fascism uh, and Japanese militarism, and after that, um, we had a period of hope and then the Cold War, et cetera. But of course, it's, it's an extremely dangerous time because in, in, in countries that have been occupied, for example, like countries that have had a dictatorship, you have a vacuum of political legitimacy. Once a regime falls, 
uh, or an occupation ends, who then has the legitimacy to, uh, to rule the country? That means that you often have civil wars uh, as a result of wars. So you saw this in Iraq. Uh, the assumption, the easy, much too easy assumption of a lot of neoconservatives and liberal hawks was that once you topple Saddam Hussein's dictatorship in Iraq, somehow um, democracy will uh, appear as by a miracle because that's what people want and people want to be free and so on. No, what you got was a civil war of, of many different factions all wanting the political to have the legitimacy to rule the country. So 19, the, uh, 1945 and the, and the immediate aftermath of World War II saw a lot of this, saw a lot of these civil wars. It was also a time of great hope because after such a catastrophic global conflict, there is a great yearning for building a world that will be better where such wars cannot happen again. And so there was a lurch, even in the United States, certainly in Europe for a brief period, even to the left. And one of the things that surprised me most when I uh, researched my book on 1945 was reading this um, uh, magazine that was edited and written by GI, American GIs, with, for a readership of GIs called uh, Yank. And Yank uh, in 1945 was way to the left of the Democratic Party today. Um, uh, desegregation of the army, uh, women's rights, all these things really came up uh, after World War II as a result of the catastrophe that had just happened. The other thing that came out of it was um, an American hegemony into what was known as the free world. And the deal that was made was the Europeans and the Japanese uh, uh, take care of rebuilding their economies, rebuilding their societies. The United States will take care of their security. And this led to a huge dependency of the democratic world on the United States. Um, and uh, this has become more and more of an anomaly. And it's something that both uh, President Obama and Trump, and Trump in his less helpful and more belligerent manner, but recognized that, that Western Europe in some ways has become uh, richer than the United States and uh, economically, and so, and certainly Japan too. And so this, this dependence is not a, uh, not a good thing. Now, the end of the American hegemony was, I suppose, good. When did it start? I, I think a lot changed with the, the collapse of the Soviet empire. And in the early 90s, people still assumed that somehow now the West has won, now we'll have liberal democracy everywhere, history has ended, uh, America's the only superpower and so on. Of course, it didn't, that wasn't true. It, but the assumption, I think, um, led to a, a feeling of hubris that ended up in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and put a great dent into the American prestige. Um, we're now really not quite yet in the post-American world or the, or the world after American hegemony. America is still by far the dominant power in the West, but this Pax Americana, this post-war deal is gradually unraveling. And uh, Macron in France is not the only one who sees that it's time for the Europeans to start taking care of their own security more than they have done in the past, and not just to rely on the United States. And that, 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 that feeling has certainly been strengthened both by the election of Donald Trump, which, get, which was a big shock, and um, Europeans started to realize uh, that you know, America was not necessarily the place they could depend on, and I think now with the uh, the, the present crisis um, has um, strengthened that feeling as well. So even in Japan, there are now voices that perhaps they should allow um, American nuclear weapons to be based in Japan, which probably has been the case already for many decades, but that it's recognized. And the next step, of course, is that the Japanese um, have their own nuclear force. And this would still be a lot of public sentiment against it, but I think it's inevitably going to happen. And I, uh, I really appreciate the nuance you put when it came to the Pax Americana ending, because it seems to me if Putin made a mistake, it was assuming 
far more it ended than it actually ended um, in terms of the, the West and its resolution and its um, just ability to push back. That, that was the overestimation that seems to have driven his strategy. I want to talk about, I want to talk about Germany and Japan in the context of, once again, another, another book you, you've written, because to, on two different angles. So the, the first angle would be a lot of folks have been talking about how frustrated they are that the end of the Cold War does not seem to have reformed Russia. Um, not only is Putin invoking the Soviet Union, but he's actually invoking the Russian Empire before that. So this is a society that is in many ways seems stuck in the 19th century. And it seems that if we could say a success of post-war US foreign policy was really convincing and forcing, it's complicated, it's a mix of these things, um, convincing the Japanese and the Germans at a deep societal level, beyond merely stationing troops in the countries to move on from the emperor to move on from Prussian militarism and change. That Korea didn't happen in Russia. So can you talk about this process, how nations move on from the past, how they regress, how they don't regress? How should we think of that in the context of World War II and then Russia now? Well, Russia, of course, is a very different, has a very different history from either Germany or Japan. Um, it's sometimes assumed, especially in the United States, that uh, Germany was sort of a militaristic uh, country, as you say, um, ruled by Prussian militarism. Uh, they didn't understand democracy and so on. And Japan was a nation of samurai who um, and was feudal and uh, all that. And it took the America, the occupation by the US and its allies to really teach these countries how to be democracies. It wasn't like that. Um, both countries in the 1920s uh, had been democracies, flawed democracies like most, but they had a, you know, a lively free press, they had political parties the, uh, and, and um, all the other things that go with, with uh, democratic rule in Japan as well as Germany. So, in 1945, when um, the, the militarists and the Nazis um, lost the war, there was a, still a generation of people who had been, uh, who had functioned in democracies to take over again and rebuild their institutions and so on. Now, the US played a very important role in creating the order in which this could take place and encouraging them and uh, and, and backing them and, uh, you know, taking care of their security and so on, so that this could take place. But these were countries that had been democracies and they could restore institutions that they'd already had. Russia is not like that. Russia's never really, unlike, say, Poland, Russia's ne never been a democracy. So after the fall of the Soviet, uh, the communist uh, empire, um, it was that was followed by a period of relative chaos. And then when Putin came in, he did restore order, but he restored an autocratic order of a kind that many Russians, of course, don't like, um, but many Russians are basically used to, which is not to say that you can't have a democracy in, in Russia uh, or that many Russians wouldn't welcome it. But it's much more difficult because they don't they didn't have the institutions or the institutional memory or the elite that had uh, run those institutions before to rebuild them after the fall of communism. And this brings up, I'm going to put this question crassly, so please correct it. Um, I, I brought this up with a, with a different guest this week, but oftentimes when Russia's actions in Ukraine are discussed. It's discussed within this historical context, which is, look, Russia has deep-seated historical concerns when it comes to the fact that Ukraine has served as a highway um, to invade from Central and Western Europe. Over 400 years, they have all this history. When it comes to Germany and Japan, these are also countries that, even with the democratic point you made, they have history. So the French and the Germans, Alsace, Lorraine, all of these deeply catastrophic war wars occur. Yet, I don't want to say that Germany and Japan have gotten over their history. That's the crass part. But it doesn't seem like a central driver of European politics is centuries of warfare between Germany and, and, and France over contested territory. So what, what, what are the factors that enable a country beyond just democracy that enable countries to get over it? Because it seems like a long-standing goal 
this century, no matter how the Ukraine crisis plays out, is convincing the Russians that no one in Western Europe intends to invade and sack Moscow. Because I think that's the part that, I just, that, that does not resonate with, with basically any Western listener. Um, how is a Europe that isn't even meeting 2% of GDP on military spending supposed to represent a threat to invading a nuclear-armed Russia? How, how should we think about this dilemma, I think? Well, I think democracy is important because uh, democracy tends to be um, an institutional way to, to, to deal with conflicts of interest um, domestically. And so it's less about it's less likely to produce leaders who have who can act out their sort of uh, paranoid visions um, based on on history, but uh, leaders you know, have to take care of the interests of their voters and they have to compromise with others and so on. So the kind of thing that Putin is doing is less likely to happen uh, in a democracy. Um, in the case of Germany and Japan, the huge, the, the catastrophic um, outcomes of the war in 1945 partly explain what happened in that both countries were really convinced, you know, this cannot happen again. And so um, even now, I think probably the, certainly the Germans are stauncher uh, defenders of democracy than almost anywhere else uh, in the Western world. And the, the Japanese still would probably the majority would vote against a revision of their pacifist constitution, which was written by Americans after the war, but which suited the Japanese very well. They don't want to go to war again. So militarism is pretty much dead, but it's easy to overestimate these historical um, tendencies. Uh, yes, Japan uh, was ruled by uh, samurai warlords or, or rulers for a long time, but uh, Japanese culture in, uh, was not completely, it was not military. And the same is true of Germany. Yes, there'll be many wars with France, but Germany, if you look at, go back in history, Germany is not a more um, uh, uh, bloodthirsty or, or militarist country than other Europeans. On the contrary, Germany is, if you think of the 30 years war uh, in the 17th century, the Germans have more often been victims of, um, of foreign invasions and wars than they have been invaders. So uh, these historical, um, uh, this sense of historical victimhood and slights, which are used by demagogues to um, whip up a sort of national fervor aimed at minorities or other countries, um, don't always have a very deep historical root. I mean, if you think of the wars in the Balkans, when um, Milosevic of Serbia used sort of ancient uh, grievances of the Serbian people uh, going back to the Middle Ages to whip up a kind of fervor against Croatians and Bosnians and Muslims and so on. This is not that this is not because uh, those kind of feelings are so deep rooted. It's that demagogues can use that kind of history uh, to great effect as Putin is doing now. So Again, I think one should not overrate history um, as an explanation. It's, it's certainly, it's, it's, it's weaponized as they say now, but um, that doesn't mean that it, it has deep roots. Something that I was thinking about as you highlighted democracy's role in disincentivizing these styles of war is, I feel like we're now just caught in loop then, because to your point, you were rightfully pointing out the real flaws of the neoconservative approach. Um, you're really seeing in Iraq and Afghanistan, not right after 9-11, but longer term, the neoconservative George W. Bush, America's foreign policy image remake democracy. We see how that ends badly, but we also see why that was actually on the table, which is this idea that we should want to have a more democratic world. But if you're looking to what Putin is saying, Putin did not take NGOs, civil society groups, groups that I think are very important. He took those as a direct threat. So where you don't have to have the perfect answer here because it's complicated as with all these issues, but where are we left when it comes to democracy promotion, given the lessons of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also seeing, well, this is what happened when autocratic rulers 
can basically do whatever they want. Yes, you're quite right. And it seems to contradict what I just said. I mean, that when people say democracies don't, don't go to war, they often mean democracies don't go to war with other democracies. But of course, democracies can start great wars um, uh, and they can justify those wars with all kinds, with, with uh, ideologies um, such as democracy promotion. And, um, and this is where history is useful because you can, you can discern certain patterns of thinking that have to do with religion and, and, and so on uh, that can explain the behavior of, of, of countries in, in specific instances. I think one of the, the problems um, that is especially the United States and Britain have had in recent centuries uh, it's a, it's both a, it's a problem that has has positive and negative effects. Is that both have a deep sense of sort of Protestant mission, um, the idea that they have the right answers, and this used to be a Christian conceit. You know, um, uh, it's the mission of of good Christians to spread the word, and to make sure that all the benighted peoples in the world. Uh, uh, come to God and, and, and Jesus Christ and, uh, and so on. And in some ways, the uh, idea that the United States and, and before the United States, Britain had a kind of mission to spread democracy is, uh, is a secular echo, I think, of that missionary spirit. And just as the missionary, the, 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 the Christian missionary spirit could turn violent as it did during the Crusades, uh, it can turn very violent in a, in a democratic guise uh, as well. And I think that is a real flaw um, in modern um, Western history. And the, the paranoia, I mean, even paranoiacs sometimes have a reason to be slightly wary. Uh, the paranoia of a Putin or, in, of, or indeed of Chinese leaders, that the West is trying to sort of um, push, throw its weight around and... Um, is not completely without uh, some kind of um, foundation. Uh, it is true that the West has thrown its weight around and has often foolishly started wars in the name of freedom and democracy uh, and so on, which is not to say that this is a justification for invading Ukraine, but um, uh, it's something that any serious student of American and European history uh, should grapple with because you know the, it, it's not just a question of as soon as um, a western leader and such as George W. Bush most recently starts talking in terms of um, dividing the world between good and evil you realize that you're in the realm of religious language and not not politics. So this is the perfect broad question slash topic to end on which is returning to the real central idea of the Churchill complex, which is this relationship between the United States and Great Britain, but also Great Britain's relationship with Europe. There's this broader, you know, to your point, we should try to avoid Manichaean good and evil language. But, you know, I've been, I've been trying to conceptualize what exactly this broad alliance against Putin is. You know, it's, there's Japan, there are Latin American countries, there's obviously the geographic West, so it's not like this is the West per se, but you could argue maybe this is the free world. But that also, once again, it's easy to start there, but very quickly that starts verging into the black and white good and evil effect, which we've seen go basically as catastrophically as one could imagine in the last 20 years. So just to sum it all up, how should we really conceive of the US's broader relationship to Britain, to Europe, but even to the broader Anglosphere as we're thinking about this reordering of the global system? Well, uh, I would defend the West in this instance because it's not um, an example of, of Western aggression of going into a country in order to bring freedom and democracy and so on. It's, it's more a defense mechanism. And I think there's great worry that, uh, especially after China and Russia formed a kind of, formed such a close relationship, that um, serious autocratic powers, and China is more serious in that respect than Russia, it's a much bigger power, um, that those powers feel threatened by, uh, country, by democratic countries. And um, uh, Ukraine uh, 
whatever its flaws, uh, however corrupt uh, its politics may have been, is still a relatively democratic country compared to Putin's Russia, which is why Putin sees it as a threat. So I think once um, an autocratic power such as Russia today invades a relatively um, democratic European country, uh, people see this as a threat to the democratic world uh, uh, as a whole. And um, so in that sense, I think the pulling together of the United States and Japan and Western Europe is a good sign. Because I think that Putin not only um, uh, underestimated uh, the way the United States would, uh, would, would react, I think a more serious uh, underestimation was the way that the Europeans would react. I think he expected uh, the president of the United States to huff and puff and make speeches and, and, and threaten and so on, but that the Europeans would just roll over because in, in as most dictators and autocrats uh, have always assumed, uh, or in recent history anyway, uh, he, he, Putin assumed the Europeans were weak, were soft, were materialistic, were addicted to Russian oil and their creature comforts and would not do anything to stand in his way uh, if, once he uh, used military force against a country um, on its borders. And the fact that the Europeans uh, did not roll over, I think was probably a much greater shock to him. That is an excellent place to leave the episode. I mentioned a bunch of books that I did not fully mention. We love to move books on the show. So Ian, we just love um, mentioning um, Japan, Germany, Year Zero, and Churchill Complex, and anything else you've written that would be of interest to listeners. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the Japan, Germany book was called uh, The Wages of Guilt. Um, I've written a book about Chinese, about dissidents in all over the Chinese world, um, which um, uh, came out, unfortunately, um, in the month of 9-11, when nobody was interested uh, in China uh, whatsoever. It was called Bad Elements. Um, and um, I'm now working or finishing a book on three wartime collaborators, uh, World War II collaborators um, called uh, the collaborators. One is a Manchu princess who, a cross-dressing Manchu princess who collaborated with the Japanese. One is a Hasidic con man in the Netherlands. And the third was Himmler's, Heinrich Himmler's masser. That's really interesting. Is that, um, I, I just watched, um... The Last Emperor. Is this the was the was the Manchu princess the woman who um, was she in that movie? I don't know if yes. you, I don't know if you, yes. So she's the she was the, she was the aviator. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's you're you're, you're the, one of the few people probably in in the, in the United States who immediately recognize this. I'm impressed. Yeah. Um. It's on. It's on HBO. It's on HBO. HBO right, right now. It's a. It's a. Just. It was a. This was a random COVID movie I watched. It was. It was an incredible movie. It's. <laughs> it's, it's a very sad movie. But um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if people want to get the reference, go check that out. And actually, here's the last actual question, Ian. What explain? What What is your interest in Japan? Um. It's. It's interesting. Japan because Japan is only going to become much more of a relevant right. topic beyond beyond. So there's obviously the culture interest yeah. in japan but at a national but which, what's your broad interest in japan well it it had nothing to do with politics um i didn't quite know what to study at university and i wanted to do something unusual that might possibly be useful as well so i studied chinese but this was in the very early 1970s when you couldn't really go to china it was still a closed country and i wasn't a romantic maoist and um, <laughs> china didn't attract me very much and then i saw uh, Japanese movies and, and modern Japanese theater and so on in Amsterdam and, and, and London and Paris. And I suddenly thought, gee, Japan is, seems a much more interesting place. Um, and so then I went to, I got a scholarship to go to film school in Tokyo. And from then on it, my interest uh, expanded, but it was really, a, uh, it was a cultural interest more than anything else. Well, that cultural interest is going to frankly going to serve a lot of people well as they think about once again because one of the and, and i need i need to do a japan focused episode on this but just this 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 even this discussion of, of remilitarizing japan given the nature of, of taiwan and, and china is a really fascinating one so another great note today ian thank you so much this has been really helpful thank you, thank you for coming on the show it was a lot of fun thank you very much